What's up, everybody? I'm Justin. Zach. And welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study. If you have your Bible, go ahead and grab that. Be in Romans chapter 15. And we're going to be looking at a sizable portion of 1 Peter chapter 2 as well. So if you want to go to 1 Peter 2, hold your place. We are going to start and spend probably 99% of our time just right here in Romans. And uh, we're going to be starting in verse 14, going to verse 21. What we'll do is we will read this and then pray and then review and then we'll continue on. Uh, Romans 15, beginning in verse 14. Paul's kind of moving on from his section on following the example of Christ. And there's going to be some things that come back up. But now he's kind of moving on to discussing his reason for writing the letter. And we've talked about his reasons for writing the letter, right? He's got two really big ones, but it goes way beyond that, right? So let's check this out. Uh, Romans 15, beginning in verse 14. Uh, Paul says, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. But on some points I've written to you very boldly by way of a reminder because of the grace given to me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God, for I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of the signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem all the way through Elysium, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. Let's pray together here. Ahem. <clears throat> Father God, we come to you right now. We are just so thankful for your word that we can read it and apply it to our lives. We are thankful for the fact that uh, you've chosen by your grace to reveal yourself to us in this way. I pray that we never take time to around your word for granted. I pray that you use this time to increase our knowledge of you and increase our faith. We love you, and it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. So, we are currently filming this in my basement, so if you happen to hear some barking, uh, that would be the dog Stanley upstairs. You can just consider those amens to whatever we're saying. So if you hear barking, you're not going insane. It is something that's happening, and he could, he's liable to bark at any time. So Paul's moving on to a new section here, right? He is now talking about his reason for writing this letter. And as you're going to see, his reason is going to get really specific, because in this Bible study for many of the videos, I, I would say probably 90% of the videos that we've put out, we've given the reason for writing this letter. Because context is key when you're looking at scripture. I mean, if you don't know the context, then it's going to be weird what comes off the page. So, Paul is writing a letter, right, to the church in Rome, and we know, right, that the church in Rome has existed for quite some time before Paul wrote this letter. And it's made up of Jewish and non-Jewish followers of Jesus. Right? Well, this is interesting because it it's a letter that Paul is writing to a church full of people he doesn't know yeah. and to a church he didn't start. And so the question becomes, what do you say to a group of people you don't know in a church you didn't start? Now, we know Paul started a lot of churches. Mm -hmm. right? He certainly would have been praying for this church. The individuals in this church definitely know who Paul is, but he doesn't know them personally. Right? But he does know that they've gone through a crisis. Right? So what happened was, at a certain point in history, and historians have a difficult time determining exactly when, right? fourth Roman Emperor Claudius dispels all the Jews from Rome and the Roman provinces. Right? You don't got to go home, but you can't stay here. All the Jews get out. Right? Well, five years later, Claudius had died, right? and all of the Jews, including the Jesus-following Jews, were allowed to return. And when the Jesus-following Jews got back into their church, they had found that things were not so Jewish anymore. Right? Matter of fact, because you'd had a five-year period of just Gentile Christians, there was really nothing Jewish culturally at all left in this church. And so when the Jews, Jewish Christians came back in trying to implement these Jewish cultural things with the Gentiles who hadn't been doing that at all in a, for a period of five years, which I think we can agree is a long time, uh, there's a lot of tension. Right? I mean, the Jewish Christians felt that these Gentile Christians needed to eat kosher, be circumcised, uh, follow the law of Moses, all these things. And so it created so much tension that the church is actually splitting. Right? And it's getting really, really bad. And if you've ever experienced a church split, you know that it's an ugly, ugly thing. Right? I mean, 
research has shown that people mourn a church split like they would someone that's passed away. And I know that sounds dramatic, but it really is that awful. Mm -hmm. So Paul writes this, all right, two big reasons, and then we're going to look at uh, a more, uh, I don't want to say niche, but a more specific reason why, why he's written it here. But first, encourage unity, because there's very much lacking unity. Mm -hmm. Secondly, uh, to give his fullest explanation of the gospel. We're going to see when we get to uh, a little bit later on that he's mm -hmm. also trying to raise money, but that's that's uh, not a primary reason mm -hmm. that he's writing. It is one, but we'll talk about that specifically a little later. Here, though, uh, he's going to talk about you know the, the, the other reason that he's written, right? So let, let's look at this. You can see it right here from verse 14, right? And we'll, we'll break it down this way. So check it out. Paul says, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers. First of all, that's really great because Paul has written very intensely on some topics. So to hear that he's satisfied about these Roman Christians is great. He's not being completely disappointed with them the whole time. And as we're going to see, he's writing to them using that very intense, bold language for a reason. He's actually going to say that here in a little bit. I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. Now, we have to remind ourselves of something we've not talked about in a while, and that is when Paul uses the word brothers, he's not just talking to dudes, right? It, 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 you can think that because brothers is the male term for that, right? As, as far as my translation is concerned, he doesn't say brothers and sisters, but that's what he means, right? Because this was written in Greek, right? That Greek word is Adelphos which is brothers and sisters. It refers to all Christians, men and women alike. Mm -hmm. So really what that verse should say is, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers and sisters. Right? Because he's writing to all Christians. And he's satisfied that they are able to instruct one another. Right? Mm -hmm. that we've got it in our heads probably after looking at what Paul's talking about and after mm -hmm. talking about what the Roman Christians have struggled with because they certainly have struggled with things. Mm -hmm. We get it in our heads that they don't do anything right. Right? They don't do anything right, and this letter is just kind of a feeble attempt by Paul to right the ship. No, he, he admits they're doing a lot of things right. Mm -hmm. Paul is not saying right that he thought they couldn't instruct people in the way of mm -hmm. God, or they had no idea how to instruct people in the way of God. One of the reasons that he's written this letter, what he's just said, is to remind them to keep doing what they know is right. He says, I'm, I'm, I'm satisfied with you guys, right, that you're able to love one another and instruct people in the ways of God. I'm reminding you that that's the right thing to do. I'm not mm -hmm. saying you can't do it. I know that you are doing it, and you need to remain doing it. Yeah, um, so Paul, in this section, uh, my translation says brothers and sisters, by the way. I, I read out the New Revised Standard Version. Um, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. Um, Paul knows that they they do. There's there's this good about them. They they uh, they have this this knowledge. Now it says all knowledge. Now they don't have the complete knowledge, but they know the truth of the gospel. Uh, they know the truth of Christ. Um, and Paul is confident that hey, y'all can work out these situations. This is a reminder, as Justin said, is to to really keep going. Uh, and that factor of kind of combining being that unity. Um, and Paul's going to get into uh, the next verse and how he, he acknowledges that it, it was a reminder to them, but and that he spoke boldly about it and so passionately about it because uh, it needed to be said. Um, but in that is they have the love of Christ, and Paul uh, is confident, uh, and more importantly reassuring them that, hey, y'all can do this thing. Uh, Y'all can be uh, united because understand Paul's not there to uh, walk them step by step uh, in the church. He doesn't even know them, but um, he's confident that um, they can come together. So, yeah. And uh, keep in mind, too, right, he, as Zach said, Paul saying you guys can do this. I, I, I know that you can. And the reason that he says this next thing, right, what we're going to look at is verses 15 and 16 together because 16 in the middle of a sentence. Um there are some things that Paul has said throughout our study of this letter that have been not harsh, but very blunt, mm -hmm. what we will call lovingly blunt, <laughs> right? And he's going to mention why he's spoken to them that way. Because there seems to be a disconnect, right? Mm -hmm. Well, if you think we can do it, why speak to us on certain matters this way? Yeah. Well, he answers that. Check it out. Mm -hmm. 15 and 16 together, and then we'll go back. But on some points, I've written to you very boldly by way of a reminder 
because of the grace given to me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So, Paul says, on some points I've written very boldly to you. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> right, because if you look at, you know, the first three chapters of Romans, it's rough, man. Mm -hmm. And it's supposed to be, because if he's given a full explanation of the gospel, there's the barking, by the way. If he's giving his fullest explanation of the gospel, then he's got to begin with the sin conversation. Mm -hmm. And you've got to know how awful sin is, how awful and corrupt it has made the human heart. Otherwise, God's grace isn't going to mean anything to you. So he says, I've written to you very boldly on some points. Right by way of a reminder, he's like, I'm not saying you were ignorant about these things, mm -hmm. but I'm reminding you of how awful sin is, how beautiful grace is, that you're justified by faith and not by works. I've written boldly. Now he says, I've written boldly because of the grace given to me by God. He's like, I'm not doing this of myself. I wouldn't be able to do this if God had not lavished grace upon me. Listen, we live and function based on the grace of God. Right? He's sovereign, and we function in our lives because of his good graces. It says, By the grace given to of God, to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God. Right? So, ministering to the Gentiles. Here's something that, we'll talk more about this here in a little bit too, but Paul is the primary minister to the Gentiles, whereas Peter is the primary minister of the gospel to the Jews. Right. Now, that's not completely mutually exclusive. It's not like Paul completely ignores the Jews. Mm -hmm. Certainly not. And it's not like Peter specifically ignores the Gentiles. Matter of fact, we're going to see here in a little bit that Peter definitely doesn't ignore Gentiles. But they're kind of, the, if you want to think of it this way, this is my own interpretation of it, they're kind of the team leaders, mm -hmm. right? Paul for the Gentiles, commissioned to take the gospel to the non-Jews, and then Peter to the Jewish people, right? So this is really consistent with, with Paul's calling, right? Acts chapter 9, Paul is called by Jesus to be a minister to the Gentiles, taking the gospel to the nations, right? So he says that, right? I am a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, and then he starts using a lot of priestly terms, right? In the priestly service, right? He, 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 to minister to the Gentiles. And we have to keep in mind, Paul's not necessarily talking about, like, being a priest in the literal sense, right? What he means is, He's, he's using a term that really applies to all believers, right? That this being in the priestly service of God. So, to explain that, let's look at 1 Peter chapter 2. If you're watching this and you have a relationship with Jesus, you might have never considered the fact, right, that you're considered to be a priest, right, or part of a royal priesthood. This applies to all believers. So when Paul says that, he's not only talking about himself, he's talking about all Christians everywhere. Here's a little context of 1 Peter, right? So, obviously, this involves the disciple Peter, right? One of the first disciples, part of Jesus' inner circle. Because within the 12 disciples, right? Jesus has an inner circle of three. be Peter, James, and John. Peter is the primary minister uh, to the Jews. But there does come a point when he goes beyond the borders of Israel with the gospel, right? Mm -hmm. Spreading the gospel in the wider Roman world. And so this letter is written way later in, in, as he's going around ministering in the wider Roman world. Right, uh, at this point, he's in Rome. He calls it Babylon, but he's in he's in Rome, right? And it's interesting. Peter dictates this letter, but he's not the one physically writing it down. Uh, it's written actually by a guy named Silvanus, who's a co-worker of Peter, who's writing everything down that Peter says. <clears throat> this is a circular letter, right? Which means it's meant to travel around to a bunch of different churches. So he's writing to a group of churches in Asia Minor, modern day Turkey, and he's writing specifically to non-Jewish Christians, right? So we, this is how we know Peter's not ignoring Gentiles. And he, he hears that these Gentile Christians are uh, being persecuted, and very simply, he writes this to encourage them to remain faithful in the midst of persecution. And so here, in chapter 2, he's going to talk about how believers are at Christ's royal priesthood, right? And so let, let's look at what he says here. First uh, Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 4 and following. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. 
So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim his, the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. He's talking about all Christians everywhere. The, 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 uh, another term for Christians would be his royal priesthood. You're, you're, you're doing the work of ministering to people. Mm -hmm. Not just leading people to Jesus, but building up people who are already members of the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. Which we'll get into a little bit later, because that's what Paul's really doing. He's not just leading Gentiles to Jesus, he's also ensuring that he pours into them. Right, and he continues to build them up. Yeah. Right, so on Sunday mornings we're doing a series through Timothy, and we're talking about being leaders. We're talking about uh, creating biblical leaders. What does it mean to be a uh, a leader in your context and to minister? And the reason that we can do that, the reason that we can confidently say you as a Christian are called to be a leader in the kingdom, mm -hmm. is really based right here. Because if you're in Christ, you're in that priestly position. Now, don't let that produce a big head because we don't deserve any of that. It's all by grace. But here, it's clear that all Christians have some calling to be a leader within their context. And so this is what Paul's getting at. We go back to Romans here. We head back to Romans 15. Not still there, verse 16. To be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. As I said, he's not just leading Gentiles to Jesus. He's building them up. And that's just as important, right, if not more so. Yes, leading people to Christ is unbelievably important. Mm -hmm. That's the command of the Great Commission, Matthew 28. Mm -hmm. But it's also important to pour into people so that they grow to look more and more like Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now, there's only so much you can do on a human level when you do that, right? It's got to be the work of the Spirit sanctifying them, mm -hmm. right? But notice that he says here, the offering of the Gentiles. Well, what is the offering of the Gentiles? Well, it's they themselves, right? They, they are offering themselves up. Mm -hmm. And the only way for them to be offered up as a sacrifice to God, right, as, as an offering to God is for them to come to know Christ and be built up in him just like everybody else right he is speaking specifically about Gentiles here because he's been commissioned to speak to them right but every single individual right becomes a offering and an acceptable offering to God through a relationship with Jesus right so through his pouring into uh, the Gentiles through his um, leading Gentiles to Christ that's how they become an acceptable offering yeah um Paul's really fulfilling the calling um, on his life from God, and that's to bring the gospel uh, to the Gentiles. Um, and thank God, because I am a Gentile. Mm -hmm. um, but and, and that's the thing is, I, a lot of people today will see that, oh, it's just the pastor, or it's just the elders or the board who's uh, really doing uh, everything, but you're called to be a leader as well. Uh, in the church, every single person is called to fulfill uh, the Great Commission. And what I love about the Great Commission is that it's make disciples. Paul Paul's building building them up. He's he's helping them grow in life. Um, and, and that's the very thing is that you're you're called to be a leader. You're 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 called to serve. You're called to fulfill the Great Commission and bring the gospel uh, to people. And what we're going to get into further is uh, bring the even the gospel to lost people, to people who don't even know who Jesus is. Um, and that's the amazing thing, um, especially because of understanding that the gospel is for all people. It's not just for Jews. It's not just for Gentiles, um, but it's for all people. So, Check out 17 and 18 together. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed. Right. So Paul is... <clears throat> able to glorify right in God for a couple of reasons. First off, he's able to glorify in God because of the calling that God has placed on his life. Right? You have to keep in mind, right? And and people always get super offended when I say something like this, but Paul was a terrorist mm -hmm. right before coming to Christ. He wasn't Paul, he was Saul and he's a terrorist. People get I remember saying that in a sermon one time and I got a very angry email, right? 
how dare I say that Paul is a terrorist? Well, he was inciting terror into people. He was trying to kill a large group of people for a supposed cause that he had in his head. That's the definition of a terrorist. Right? And so he's going, going around trying to eliminate as many Christians as possible until Jesus lovingly ambushes him on the road to Damascus. And, uh, over, you know, Paul gives, end up giving his life to Christ, baptized by Ananias. He uh, becomes Saul, becomes Paul, becomes one of the greatest Christian leaders of all time. Paul's never forgotten that, right? He glorifies God because of this calling. He wouldn't want to be doing anything else, right? He knows that it is his mission to take the, the message of life in Jesus to the nations. And so he says, I'm not going to speak anything. I'm not going to really boast in anything except what Christ has done through me. And you know what? On, one, on, a, on a level applicable to us, that's perfectly acceptable. It is perfectly okay. Because we always talk about not being proud or whatever. That's true. Pride can be a nasty thing. But it is perfectly okay. In fact, encouraged to be proud of what Jesus is doing through you. Mm -hmm. Now, you have to keep in mind, it's not what you're doing, right? It's all what Christ Jesus is doing through you. Look at the language that Paul uses there, right? In Christ Jesus, I have reason to be proud. He doesn't say, of myself, I am proud, mm -hmm. right? In Christ, I'm proud of the work that he's doing through me. And matter of fact, he goes so far as to say, I'm not going to talk about anything except what Christ has done through me. And that does not mean that Paul's being robotic. I will not speak of anything, yeah. right, and be unnatural. He's not being weird about it. But he's saying, I'm not going to boast in anything except what the Lord has done through me, right? Allowing the Gentiles to come to Christ. Because that's incredible, Right, and what you see is you see thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people coming to Christ, right? As Paul and his co-workers preach the gospel in the wider world, right? So, um, what I, is the recognition? It, it's not Paul boasting in his own self of his own human achievement. It, it's the realization and the rejoicing that God is working through him, um, and it, to really understand that's a real humbling experience. Um, is that we we really don't do anything. We're just a vessel. Mm -hmm. We're we're a vessel and everything, and and that's so humbling. But I, I'm glad uh, because if you were to put all that on me, I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. um, but understanding that they're they're um, by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's directing me. It's guiding me. Um, the Holy Spirit's doing the work so this person can come. Uh, to the feet of Jesus is something so special that we'd have a God that says, hey, I want to use you in bringing people to me. Um, and that's a very special thing coming from a God um, who's perfect, uh, who's all-knowing, but also says, hey, I want a relationship with you, but also I want a relationship with that person over there too. Mm -hmm. And guess what? I'm going to use you to bring them uh, to me. Uh, and that's very, very special um, in understanding how God is very intimate with us how God gets very personal with his creation, and how kind of God behaves uh, and interacts with his creation. So notice that he says bringing the Gentiles to Christ by word and deed. It's not just by teaching, right? It's actual discipling and ministering. Paul is getting his hands dirty with these people, mm -hmm. right? He's not just preaching and then leaving, yeah. right? He is involved in their lives. He, he wants to walk alongside them, mm -hmm. right? Is he doing that with 100% of them? Maybe not, but he's making himself available to anyone, yeah. right? Because historically, and this may be something shocking to you, um, the historical records think that a lot of a lot of scholars will say Paul wasn't the best speaker. He gives a lot of really good information, but he wasn't a powerful preacher. I will remind you, right, in Acts, when Paul is preaching in the upper room of a house, right, and this guy named Eutychus falls asleep, falls out of a window and dies and then gets revived, right? He falls asleep in the middle of Paul's sermon, so either he's really, really tired, right, or Paul wasn't that dynamic of a speaker, right? And I've, I've had several professors mention that what Paul was saying was unbelievably great, but his public speaking ability was not 100 out of 100, mm -hmm. right? So it can't just be by word that he's doing these things. It's got to be by deed mm -hmm. as well. And it doesn't stop there, right? He gives the Holy Spirit the credit that it deserves. Look at what he says in verse 19. By word and deed, verse 19, by the power of the signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to, I mispronounced this earlier, this one is the, this is a hard, it's Illyricum, is how you say it. From Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, I have 
fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. So, signs and wonders. Paul is giving credit to the broader power of the Holy Spirit mm-hmm. here, but through because the Spirit does a lot of very incredible signs and one or signs and wonders, all these different things through Paul, right, and in and around Paul to be able to allow the Gentiles to come because there's really no work that's going to, as Zach mentioned, there's nothing in and of ourselves that we can do if the Spirit's not working. It's got to be the work of the Spirit interceding for you, being the foundation for, for what you're doing uh, to be able to allow people to come. And he says, it's it's worked throughout my entire ministry, from Illyricum to Jerusalem. So, Illyric, you, you know where Jerusalem is, right? It's the capital of, of Israel right now, right? Illyricum, right, it would be like modern-day Serbia, Albania mm. is about where that is. So that's how far Paul's Paul's mission field is gone, mm. right? It's gone from um, Illyricum, right, in the east, all the way right west. It's hard to mm. imagine this, all the way back west to where, like, Serbia and Albania. So he's covered a wide area, and he says, in that area, I've been very blessed to see God do incredible things through me and the Spirit doing signs and wonders to allow people to come to Christ. Yeah, um, and what I love about um, that great distance of how uh, how Paul goes through and what God is doing through Paul um, and bringing the gospel is the fact that we're supposed to take the gospel to the entire world. Um, and that's the, obviously, fulfilling the Great Commission. Um, and what I love about the church, the early church, the ancient church in Acts, after, after the death of Stephen... Um, Christians are being persecuted. Uh, this is about Acts eight. Um, they scatter. They, they they scatter because of persecution. Um, but the int- the interesting thing is, out of that, out of something so terrible, something so terrifying, is that the gospel is actually taken to these places that the apostles and the disciples scatter. Um, and so this good is brought out, and these churches are started. And that's the amazing thing is that. Um, the gospel was taken to the entire world. Um, and as you can see today, all the way over here, we're in America. We're in the United States of America, and we know the gospel. And that's that's the thing, but that's the Great Commission. Um, and so uh, really understanding that is the magnitude of what Jesus is saying in the Great Commission uh, is that th- this will be preached to the entire world, and it should be so. Luke 20 and 21 together. Thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. So Paul is very much a pioneering spirit, right? He wants to go and preach the gospel where people have never heard of Jesus before. Mm -hmm. He's just said he doesn't want to build on someone else's foundation. Now, let me make something clear. There's nothing wrong with preaching the gospel where it's already been preached. Mm -hmm. Right? Paul is not speaking out against that. He's speaking of the the kind of deep conviction that he personally has mm-hmm. to go where it's not been preached before. Mm-hmm. He doesn't want to build on someone else's foundation, right? Mm-hmm. He wants to go where people have no clue who Jesus is. Mm-hmm. Right? And by the way, at this point, there's a lot of places, mm-hmm. right, where that do not know Jesus and even in the modern day, there's a lot of places that don't know Jesus. Mm-hmm. And that's a little scary because we want to go somewhere where someone's already done the work mm-hmm. so that we can you know, they've already got some sort of idea, so it makes our job a little less difficult. Mm-hmm. Spreading the gospel is not about avoiding difficulty, mm-hmm. right? It's about being faithful. It's about being faithful to that Great Commission. And so, you know, I hear people all the time, you know, talk about wanting to go and do work in about the island nation of Haiti. Well, that's amazing, right? You should go and do work mm-hmm. there. But in terms of gospel spreading, right, Haiti's very reached, mm-hmm. Right, the, it, it's it's been very much reached with the gospel. Are there are a hundred percent of the people there believers? No, just like everywhere else. But um, it, that's that's one of the prime examples that's given. Right, going to Haiti and doing work is amazing. But there's also places that are completely and totally unreached. Mm-hmm. Right? There's an app that you can get called the Joshua Project, and it will tell you all the different tribes around the entire world who've never heard of Jesus before, or who like one percent of the population. Right knows who Jesus is. Paul wants to go to those places. He doesn't want to build on what someone else has done, right? And it's not him being cocky, right? They've been called to minister there. They've done the work there. I'm going to go somewhere else, right? Because you got to think it's a little bit counterproductive just to keep going where people have already gone because then you're ignoring the other places, right? Here, right, he quotes Isaiah 52, 15, 
Right? He says, those who've never been told of him will see. Those who've never heard will understand. Paul sees his pioneering spirit kind of as a fulfillment of that prophecy. Mm-hmm. Right? Those who've never heard of Jesus, I'll be the one to take him to him. Mm-hmm. Right? Those who've never seen or heard of him, they'll, they'll go and they'll understand. Because I'm seeking to go to places no one else has gone before. Yeah. Um, this is, um, I had mentioned earlier, but taking the gospel to the lost, taking the gospel to people who have no clue who Jesus is. Um, and like Justin said, um, it's not wrong to preach the gospel in places where Jesus is known. There's that reminder um, of what you have to tell people about who Jesus is, that he is the Messiah. Um, but it's it's very important that we take it to the lost. Um, but also understand, though, too, you're not wanting to steal sheep. And Paul mentions that. Um, he doesn't want to build on someone else's foundation. Um, you, we're, not in, we're not in this to switch gym memberships from people from one church to another that's that's not what it's about but it's seeing people's uh life changed life transformed uh but bringing the gospel taking uh this good news gospel means good news um to people who are hurting who are broken whose life uh who are in desperate desperate need of a savior and that is jesus um and teaching about okay who is this man who came down from his glory on high um to die for you and three days later resurrect um and that's what they really really need to understand so and with that we come to the end of our time this morning if you have questions comments concerns you can email uh, in the, our emails in the description of this video study guide with the cross references that we mentioned also in the description of this video uh two services on sunday we are continuing our trek through first and second timothy Right, and so uh, again, two services as always. So, thank you guys so much for being here. I'll have Zach pray us out, yeah. and then we'll be dismissed. Let's pray. God, we thank you um, for being you. God, you you love us so much that you sent your one and only Son Jesus for us, and we thank you for that. We thank you for Paul that the work you did through him it, it was amazing, Lord. And just to read about it, read about what he's writing through, how your whole uh, how the Holy Spirit is. Uh, guiding him it's amazing to see how far the church has come and how we can learn so God open our minds and our hearts to what we read today what the power of the gospel means how it changed our lives and how it could change someone else's so let us understand we pray this in your heavenly name amen amen thanks guys have a great week